three kinds of men. The book of 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Next verse. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, number one, for doctrine that does calia. That is teaching. The scriptures are profitable for teaching. They are given to us for explanation. The scriptures are for explanation. They are not for singing. Do you realize that throughout the ministry of Jesus, there was never praise worship before he taught? Throughout his ministry. So that means singing is not primary. What is primary is the teaching of the word. The scriptures are given to us for teaching. That's why I say a bishop must be up to teach, must be able, skillful in teaching. Amen. There's no substitute for teaching. There's not whatsoever no substitute for teaching. So Paul said to these people, when I came, I couldn't speak unto you as unto spiritual. They were spiritual, but he had to use a figure of speech. Even though they were spiritual, they were acting like carnal people. In their conduct, they were carnal. In their nature, they were spiritual. It is possible to be spiritual in your nature and carnal in your conduct. And he says these people are babes. They are what? They are babes. Romans chapter 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. To walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free or made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his son, his own son, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Next verse. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because a carnal mind is enmity against god for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can be so then they that are in the flesh cannot please god verse 9 but you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Next verse. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Next verse. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in in you next verse therefore brethren we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh for if you live after the flesh you shall die but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh you shall live i didn't hear a good amen, amen. so we have the spirit of god in us and because we have the spirit of god in us we are born of the spirit that makes us spiritual spiritual is our nature that's our nature. Look at that Romans chapter 8 verse 14. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the spirit of the law of Moses. But you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba Father. Next verse. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And next verse. If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together with him. Amen? So, we are in him, he is in us. Can somebody shout, I have the spirit of sonship. I have the spirit of sonship. So, you are not in the flesh. Why? Because you are born of the spirit. You are not in the flesh because you are born in the spirit that which is born of flesh is flesh that which is born of spirit is spirit so you see you are born of the spirit which implies that you're not in the flesh because you're born of the spirit you're spiritual by nature by birth 
your spiritual. He calls the unbeliever the world. He calls the unbeliever natural. He called the unbeliever of the flesh. In fact, Paul calls the unbeliever mere man. Mere man, ordinary fall. First Corinthians 3 1. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes. Where? In Christ. You are in Christ, but you are carnal. That means you are spiritual by nature, but you are carnal by conduct. You see that? You are carnal by conduct. You are spiritual by nature. See? That's what Paul was taking time to emphasize. He is using a figure of speech. I couldn't speak to you as unto. As unto. is a figure of speech. He's not saying you are carnal. No. He is saying that you are spiritual. But your conduct is reflecting what an unbeliever's conduct will reflect. That's to say your nature has not affected your conduct. Even though you have the nature. And he said when that happens. You are a babe. And therefore when that happens. The mode of communication with you. Should reflect the same mode we will use to communicate with unbelievers. That's why I say you are carnal. Carnal means you are fleshy. He didn't uh, economize the use of words in that verse. He gave them their classification. So naturally, you cannot be a carnal person. But you are carnal in your conduct. How will somebody desire entertainment in church? And if there's no entertainment, he will leave the service. He comes to church waiting for comedy. He comes to church waiting for dancing and singing. And if we just say today is word throughout, he is disappointed. He goes. Have you seen what we're talking about? He is spiritual, but in his conduct, he has developed carnal appetites. What kind of appetite? Carnal. He's carnal. He's born of God. But has not grown to where his conduct reflects his nature. Paul calls him a babe. How many of you know that the epistles were written to fix the behavior of believers? That's why there are so many instructions in the epistles. If you be risen, do this. If you be this, do this. Do this. Do this. A lot of instructions. Because the conduct of a believer is very key. Is very, very key. Amen. Look at the way Jesus described the disciples that were with him in Matthew chapter 14 verse 31. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? When he called his disciples of little faith, what he was saying is, O ye of no faith. That's the Greek. He didn't say, the Greek didn't say little. It's just translation. It means you don't have faith. O ye, you are acting as if you don't have faith. You have no faith. Why did you doubt? That's the way Jesus described it. And remember these people have healed the sick. These people have done miracles. Remember before now. But their conduct in this particular situation. In this context. Their conduct was a conduct of no faith. And Jesus didn't economize words. He gave it to them straight. Are you with me here? Look at Matthew 17, 17. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. Because they couldn't cast out a demon. Jesus called them faithless and called them twisted, perverse. Look at the words he used in describing his own disciples. Because in their conduct, they didn't reflect what he has taught them. They didn't reflect faith. He, he Brutally described them as perverse. Perverse generation. Talking to his disciples. They were perverse in their behavior. They were perverse in their behavior. Look at Mark 16, 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They were operating in unbelief. He upbraided them. He rebuked them. He rebuked them. Are you following me? Are you following me? Yeah. So there's a way believers are supposed to behave. When you are born of the spirit, it's not enough. It must reflect in your conduct. There's a way believers are supposed to dress. They dress nice, but in their dressing, they reflect who they are. 
Are we together here? Yeah. Don't dress like a masquerade. Or you dress haphazardly. Or you dress half naked. It doesn't reflect who you are. The conduct must reflect the nature. A sister puts on a cloth where she cannot move freely. She has to move with caution. And if there's a situation that requires running, she will either have to tear the cloth and run naked or she will have to be caught up with the situation. What kind of dressing is that? Where the spirit of the Lord is? She should dress in a way she can be liberated. The Bible talks about modesty. It talks about what? Modesty. modesty. The nature of Christ must reflect in your conduct. It must reflect in your conduct. Teaching good. I say teaching good. Do all things to the glory of God. It's not that God will be glory. It's not that God will take glory out of it. But whatever you have done will reflect Christ. And people will see Christ glorified in you. Are we together here? Matthew 16, 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He called Peter Satan. That's not a kind word. And this is Peter, who just four, four verses away, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. But now he has behaved contrary to who he is. So Jesus gave him the address brutally. Get thee behind me, Satan. So Christians can be called Satan. See, Christians can be called Satan. Christians can be called perverse generation. Because Jesus used those words. Jesus used those words. And somebody says, but that is in the gospel. Don't worry, we shall soon enter the epistles. Luke chapter 9 verse 54. And when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? He turned and rebuked them and said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. This is when Christians begin to pray for people to fall and die, 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 die. Everybody that does something for you, leprosy, die, be blind, be deaf, let your intestines fall out. Your, your own lips full of judgment. Jesus rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. If you know what manner of spirit you are of, you won't be saying the things you are saying. For the son of man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. It must reflect in the way you talk. It must reflect in the way you pray. It must reflect in the way you communicate with people. The nature of the new man on your inside. The word rebuke them is a Greek word, epitenisen. It means same way he rebuked demons. Because their conduct was totally different from what he taught them. Do you know that he even called his disciples fools? Luke 24, 25. He called them fools. The word fool means stupid. So it is not a bad thing to call somebody a fool, especially if he exhibits it. Fools. Anetos. That's the Greek word. It means stupid. Fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Fools. In Galatians 3, 1, Paul now begins to talk. He says he calls an entire church foolish. Foolish Galatians. In their conduct, in their conduct, they were foolish. And he gave it to them. He called them foolish Galatians. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit. In one chapter I called them foolish twice. Are you not being perfect in the flesh? Having begun in the spirit. Amen. First Timothy 6 9. They that will be rich. Fall into temptation and a snare. And into many foolish. See that. Foolish. The word foolish was used in the epistle. Titus 3 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. You know, but after that, the kindness and love of our God and Savior toward man appeared. He was talking about where we were before we got born again. So when a believer is acting foolish, he's acting out his former conduct before he got born again. And there is no economizing in the usage of the description of his status as at that time, as it reflects his former life. He called them foolish. Are we teaching here? He calls them foolish. Hallelujah. When Jesus called them foolish and perverse, were they still his sheep? Yes, they were still his sheep. 
So born again believers can be foolish. They call them foolish Galatians. These were Christians. A whole church, born again people plus their bishops, elders and pastors, deacons and deaconesses. Foolish. They could have taken offense at that. But they were sober and humble enough to take correction. Praise the Lord. Why were they foolish? Because they were not listening and acting on the word of God. They were not acting on the word of God. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Awake to righteousness. Do you know the meaning of the word awake? Awake. Awake is a Greek word. E-K-N-E-P-I-O. Eknepio. It is used for somebody who is in a drunken stupor. He is so drunk. So when he says awake to righteousness, what he's saying? Awake from being drunk. Awake to righteousness. You are drunk with sin consciousness. Awake to righteousness. And sin not. Come out of your stupor. Come out of your stupor. Amen. You know, when a lady gets used to nightclub, nightclub, she won't know when she uses nightclub cloth to come to church. Because she's in her stupor. Is it true? Yeah. As far as she's concerned, she loses every sense of decency. She, she doesn't know again the difference between church and nightclub. In fact, she doesn't know when her wardrobe ran out of decent clothes. Because she's in a stupor. And the same way they celebrated at nightclub, she thinks she'll be celebrated like that in church. She's in a stupor. Yes. She has deceived herself. So that is why people in church should be sharp enough who are, who are matured in Christ to give her accurate description of her status. Foolish. Awake. I'm teaching now. Some people won't like this. <laughs> but if you love the other one, you must love this one. <laughs> Nothing can stop the place of modesty and decency. Once it has happened in your inside, it will start reflecting. Oh yes, the first few weeks and months and years of your Christianity, you are still growing. So you, it's allowed. But a time must come when what has happened inside starts reflecting on the outside. You can't be perpetually looking like you were before. Then you are not looking into the mirror. You are not looking into the mirror. Because if you are looking into a mirror, you are not a forgetful hearer. You will start doing what you are hearing. Teaching good? It will start showing. God punish the devil. Ephesians 5.14 Look at Paul talking to believers. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead. A born again believer, Paul is calling him a dead man. He is calling a born again believer dead. Because the believer is dead in his conduct. He is dead in his conduct. He is alive in his spirit, but dead in his conduct. So Paul did not economize words. He described his conduct to him exactly the way it is. Christ shall do what? The word arise there is the Greek word E-G-E-R-R-I-O. It means to be raised up from the dead. Resurrection. It means to raise him from the dead. Verse 15. That see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. That word circumspectly means be careful. Not as fools, but as wise people. You see? As wise people. 1 Timothy 5, 6 to 8. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Eh, this is a serious matter. Brother Paul, why are you getting to this place? <laughs> Look at verse 7. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. Next verse. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Verse 5. Now, she that is a widow indeed, it is widows Paul was addressing. Paul didn't leave any stone on top. He was addressing widows. He said there are widows, and there are widows indeed. All widows are not in the same class. There are widows, and there are widows indeed. 
Who is a widow? One whose husband is dead. Who is a widow indeed? She is desolate. She trusted in God. And continued in supplication and prayers. Night and day. Her life is given to prayer. That's a widow indeed. Next verse. But she that liveth in pleasure. Paul is very strong here. He says she's dead. She's lazy. She likes pleasure. She's either in one wedding or another wedding from one ceremony to another ceremony because she thinks she's not a widow. From one naming ceremony to one wedding ceremony to one burial. Every time she is in one party or the other, she is dead while she's alive. Can you see the level of seriousness this matter is, is attracting in the epistles? Paul did not only settle in dealing with brethren. He has even entered widows. Show you the seriousness of conduct. He said that widow that is all over the place having a nice time, she's dead. So anybody that loves pleasure at the expense of his spiritual development is a dead man. How can you call a born again man dead? He is alive in the spirit but dead in his conduct. Teaching good? Yeah. Dead in his conduct. Dead in his conduct. She is dead. That word dead is a figure of speech describing the attitude and the behavior of somebody who likes pleasure. You know there are people in church every Saturday Every Sunday, they are in one naming ceremony, one party somewhere. You never see them sit down to see Christ. They just like party. They're living in pleasure. And they are dead. No prayer. No hospitality. No evangelism. They are not committed. They come late to church. Most times they don't have Bible. The only writing part they bring, they leave it for ushers. No commitment. Oh, to stay for second service is a major problem. They can never stay for second service because there is a, there is a series on TV they are going to watch. Or there's a friend they want to visit and just gist. Just waste away the time. She living, she's living in pleasure. And Paul says she is dead. She is dead. And we together here. Why? Because the nature of the unbeliever likes pleasure. So when a believer becomes pleasure driven, oh, his conduct has betrayed his identity. Praise the Lord. You know the world is pleasure driven. Is that true? That's why the world is full of sex appeals. They're advertising food. They will show a naked woman with a spoon. What has nakedness got to do with food? We're talking of food that people will eat. Yet the person that will showcase the food, she is half naked. That's the world. Sex appeal. The videos that are rated high in the secular are videos of nudity and sexuality. Yeah, with profanity. Those are the videos that are rated high. Because the world system is designed to function with pleasure. That's why a believer cannot afford to be pleasure driven. He must be Christ driven. Teaching good? I, you, the world is so wicked, you know. Praise the Lord. The world is so wicked. First Timothy 5 15. He said, For some are already turned aside after Satan. He says, Some widows have already turned aside after Satan. There must have been a widow problem in that church. He says, Some of these widows have already turned aside after Satan. And same people Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I could not speak to you at all so spiritual, but as unto carnal, even babes in Christ. As a young person, as a, a believer, as a born again child of God, you must not allow pleasure overtake you. To even come and pray is a problem. How can we do prayer? How, somebody should rest. Rest. And you know, the job of the world is to keep creating appetites. That's the work of the world. They create appetite for you. Today a phone is out. Tomorrow they bring an improved edition. Creating appetite. Today a fashion is out. Tomorrow another fashion is out. 
Another tomorrow they improve on that fashion. And a believer that is not committed to Christ will start running around after all these fashions and after all these latest things at the expense of spiritual development. At the expense of spiritual development. Now you have four different phones, yet you have never given an offering of 5,000 naira. You have four different phones. It shows where your, 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 post, your appetite is. It shows where your heart is. Amen. Fashion is the same. It just rotates. It just rotates. If you keep your suit around for a while, they will come back to the same thing. Fashion has never changed. It has always been the same circle. Very soon, those long, long shoes will come back. You know those? Yes. They will come back very soon. They will, they are coming back. Fashion never goes. It just rotates. So if you keep running around the circle, it means you are vain. It means you are vain. You dress for beauty and glory. You don't dress as a showbiz person. You dress for beauty and glory. Except if your business, you show business. And if it is show business, then that is your calling there. That's what you do for a living. And even in that, you have to do it with modesty. You have to do it with what? I can't imagine a sister in the church, born of the spirit of God, in the name of movie acting, appearing nude in a movie. Even if it's a drama, the nudity is not a drama. You didn't hear what I said? The nakedness of the lady in the drama, that nakedness is not a drama. There is no dramatized nakedness. It's carnality. What is it? Huh? What are you talking about? Yes. <laughs> she acted, but the acting was in nakedness. There's nothing like his drama. Drama. Somebody is kissing you and smooching you and you say it's drama. It's drama. In the name of acting. What kind of acting is that? They that are in the flesh, they mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit, mind the things of the spirit. Some of you won't like this, but I don't care. If you are born of the spirit, you will mind it. So Paul was dealing with conduct. Yes, you are born of God, but it has to reflect. Are we together here? Yes, it has to reflect. It has to reflect. Because if it doesn't reflect, something is wrong somewhere. It's either you're not born again. In 1 Corinthians 13, 11, when I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. I put it away. I put it away. A child that is a believer that is a child spiritually will behave like an unbeliever. You didn't hear that. Children complain about everything. They are irritated easily. Like those are symptoms of being ch childish. Amen. I said, Amen. Yeah, they come to church because there's transport. If there's no transport, they don't come. They are children. They come to church to dance. Any service where there's no dancing, they're very sad. They even leave. Those are children because they don't know what they have come to do. That's why Jesus addressed a particular man calling a rich fool. Because the man taught by amassing wealth, his soul can rest. He said, you fool. A man's life does not consist in the things he gathers. A man's life doesn't consist in the abundance of things that he possesses. They can't stay for long services. When the service is getting a bit long, they are restless. It shows where their heart is. First Timothy 6, 11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. There are things to flee. There are things. Look at how Peter describes these people in Second Peter 1 night. But he that lacked these things is blind. He's born again, but he's blind. And cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He that lacked these things, add to your faith virtue, add to virtue knowledge, add to knowledge patience. 
he that lacks those things is blind. He's born again, but he's blind. That's the description Peter is giving it. He said the man is blind. And because of that, look at the next verse. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If these things, if you do these things, you shall never fall. 11. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Christ. So a man that does not take into cognizance this nature of God in him reflecting in his character is blind. He cannot see afar off. And he has forgotten, you know, James said it. Look at into the mirror and takes away his face straight away. He forgetteth what manner of man he was. Same thing Peter is talking about. The God of this world has messed him up. You know the parable of the sower? He said those of them that received the word and the word did not produce the deceitfulness of riches coming in choke the word. The deceitfulness of riches. Look at the way John puts it. We have seen Paul. We have seen Jesus. We have seen Peter. Look at John. First John 3 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth where? You are born again but by your conduct you are dead. Because you do not love your brother. Look at the next verse. Whosoever hated his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. In conduct, you hate your brother. You are a murderer. And by acting, you are not showing that you have eternal life. By your conduct. You are using your conduct to discredit your identity. Very serious. 3.13 Marvel not by brethren, if the world hate you. See that. You can't be a friend of the world when you operate like this. Look at the way James put it in James 4, 8. Draw nigh to God. He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. He calls a brother sinner, a sinner. Because that brother is not acting like Christ. So you see the way James, Paul, Jesus, Peter, see the way they are talking to believers. Why? James 4.4 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. He called them adulterers and adulteresses. The word friendship is the word philia. Where you have Philadelphia from. Philia, it means affection. You know? The word filia means when you feel at home with the ideas of this world. You feel at home with it. You play secular music and you're speaking rotten words but you're very comfortable. You're dancing them without feeling anything. You're at home. You feel at home. You have adapted into their environment and it has become your habitation. Friendship with the world. Friendship with the world. It's the same thing Peter talked about. Be not conformed to this world. So these people have conformed. They have conformed. Amen. Why will a believer be like this? Because the believer has a diet problem. <laughs> he has what? Diet problem. Once you love this wisdom of this world, you know, you remember what the wisdom of this world is? Success steps, motivational speaking, dating and marriage conferences everywhere, 40 steps to success, uncommon solution for uncommon men. Your faith is built on the wisdom of men. You cannot be spiritual. It's not possible. You can't use secularism to feed the spirit. The spirit is fed by spiritual food. You can't. You can't. Praise the Lord. First Peter 2.2 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. It has to do with thinking. Desire the word that will affect the way you think. 
first corinthians 3 2 i have fed you with milk and not with meat for hitherto you are not able to bear it neither yet now are ye able what's the difference well the church at corinth is the only church paul addressed and used a lot of figures of speech and parables that church is full of figurative expressions he used it a lot and you know parables don't make people grow so um, because the only thing they could handle were parables so he had to feed them that that's why it took them time to grow if you read the book of corinthians it was dealing with problem chapter one chapter two chapter three chapter four chapter twelve it is at chapter 12 paul began to say now concerning spiritual things i will not have you ignorant <laughs> because he was busy dealing with carnal issues in that congregation there was no time for them to grow spiritually and some people like churches where they are told parables. They don't like revelation. They want parables. You know when David met Goliath? David said, Goliath? Goliath said, Devo. They started fighting. Ah, he said, hey, pastor can preach. As far as you are concerned, that is good preaching. You are paddling around uh, parables. You can't grow. Jesus said, parables are given to those without. That hearing they may hear and not hear. Got to go into deep things. Revelation. The unveiling of the Christ. For the believer to grow. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Jesus too spoke in a lot of parables. Mark 4, Luke 8, Matthew 13. He explained to them. And in John chapter 16 he said to them. I have yet many things to say to you. But you cannot bear them now. But how be it. When he the spirit of truth is calm. He will take that which is mine. And he will show you. He will show you what I wanted to say, but I couldn't say because of your capacity. Deeper things. Going into mature things. The diet is important. Do you know that the books a man buy reflect his, his, his stage in Christianity? When somebody buys books without knowing who the authors are, just buy them because they look nice packaging. He has a problem. In the library of a brother, you see Moses and uh, Paul inside. Moses lined up, Paul lined up, and secularism lined up. All of this is his spiritual library. How far is he going to grow? Judgmental prayers in one section. You see them all. You see a mixture, a blend, and he calls it balance. To him is balance. Little grace and little love mix balance. And Paul calls him foolish. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. The second thing apart from diet that will affect a brother is company. The company you keep. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And James says friendship with the world is what? Enmity with God. You see sister hanging out with an unbeliever. What are you doing with him? You see, I just needed a listening ear. He's giving me a listening ear. My heart is heavy. I want to offload it. The brethren in church are too busy. They don't have my time. He has my time. Something is wrong with her. When it is an unbeliever that has listening ear for you, you have told us where you belong. You have exactly told us where you belong. The scripture says, casting your cares upon the Lord. How can a non-believer be your listening ear? I'm not of this world. I thought somebody would say that. I'm not of this world. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 15, 30, look at the way Paul put it. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners what does he do no matter how spiritual you are when you begin to play with unbelievers it will corrupt you there's no how spiritual you can be and play among unbelievers comfortably he didn't say good manners corrupt evil communication he say evil corrupts good he didn't say good corrupts evil he say evil corrupts good when a brother begins to misbehave in church, know that he has changed his friends. 
If you find out, you will see that there is a new set of people in his life. Every time you see somebody misbehaving, check what is around him. You will see a new set of human beings around him. Uh -uh. Somebody was very humble, gentle, nice, obedient. Suddenly he starts behaving crazy. Something has come over him that was not there before. I've been around for a while to know these things. I've worked with people so long that I can tell you. By the time you begin to company with those who have no respect for the things of God, you yourself, you will start disrespecting the things of God. Are we together here? Look, if you can get it right with your company, 50% of your work has been achieved. If you can get the right company with you, 50% of your Christian journey is settled. Company is important. The people you hang with. Show me the people you're hanging with. I can predict your next 50 years without prayer. I can tell you where you will be. Just show me the people around you. Because the influence around you programs your future. It affects your choices. It affects your decisions. Are we, are we here? Huh? Uh, powerful. Company is powerful. Now the word corrupt is used two times in the scripture. 1 Corinthians 3.17 2nd Corinthians 7 2, 2nd Corinthians 11 3. Put up 2nd Corinthians 11 3. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is where? In Christ. Your mind can be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It can be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. I you begin to look for 50 steps. 125 keys to maintaining the Christian life. 125. You have not even kept one. It's 125. You're corrupted. Your mind is corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Wrong company will always affect the believer. Wrong company. Wrong company. A good intention Christian can be corrupted. There are people that are born again. Paul said, don't relate with them. Did you hear what I said? They are what? They are born again. But Paul said what? Keep them away. They are born again. They are in church. They speak in tongues. But Paul said, don't relate with them. I'm going to give you a few of them. The book of 1 Corinthians 5.11 But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an exhaustioner, with such a one, know not to eat. Don't eat with him, no matter how hungry you are. It's better you starve than eat with him. Very hard. Because if a brother is found with any of this as a lifestyle, as a lifestyle, he's living in it. And he has not seen anything wrong with it. Even when he's corrected, he resists correction. Don't keep him with you. Any brother. <laughs> a brother just pick a sister and they start living together. They start living together. No marriage, nothing. Americans call it the moving. They do what? Uh, cohabitation. I don't know what's wrong with sisters. This problem is a lot more with sisters. You just follow a man and start living in his house, cooking and washing for him. For what? Is that how cheap your father raised you up? And nothing is wrong. They sleep and wake up and come to church and go back. And they are workers. Workers in the church. That's why when you say evangelize, they don't want to start house fellowship. They know what is there. Start house fellowship. They tell you, eh, eh, I would rather go and pastor somewhere. They know what is there. He said, if you find such, don't keep company with them. In fact, their food should be a taboo. Yes. Don't eat with them. And as you're hearing me today, if you're one of them, that ends today. Go and pack your load and get out of that place. Yes. Don't keep them. Some of you go close to them and say, I understand what you're going through. I understand. Just try you here. This is not a matter of, a, of, of comforting. It's a matter of 
sharp rebuke. Take your things and get out of the house. It's not something to pamper. A sister is destroying her life. A brother is dying. And you are pampering them in debt. Do they pamper people inside coffee? Ah. He said, don't eat with them. If a brother is a fornicator, a brother is a covetous person. Covetous. He cheats people in the church. He covets people's things. He's greedy. He's not satisfied with his own. He borrows and doesn't pay. Or an idolater. In the morning he's in church. In the evening he's in a shrine somewhere. He goes around prayer houses. Or a railer. Quarrelsome. Quarrelsome. He fights with everybody. Paul took time. Or a drunkard. And every time I ask you what I drink, he say a little for my stomach's sake. Don't eat with him. Or an extortioner. That is, he cheats people. Yes, he uses tricks to collect people's things. And after he has collected, he will say, leave it for me in faith. Sow it as a seed. <laughs> with such a one, know not to eat. I'm teaching good. First Timothy 6 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt mind and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw yourself. People that take advantage of brethren in church, take advantage of brethren, and use something that looks like gospel to collect money from them. Yes razzmatazes them and collects money from them. He said, withdraw from such people. Withdraw from such people. There are a lot of them in this country and around. They are all over the place. Charlatans. Merchandisers. Who when they start before the church to preach, as far as they are concerned, all the members are their goods. The church is a business shop. Everybody in that congregation is a good. It's good to be traded for profit. Making merchandise of God's people. He said, withdraw from such people. The interesting thing is that members are so gullible that it is such preachers that they go after. They go after such people because such people make them feel good. They don't know what they're looking for. They razzmatazz them, collect their money, abuse them, and they're, they are sitting there happy. Promising them of a future that will never come. Merchandisers. Merchandisers. And there are many. Selling and buying in the church. Selling and buying. Using every manner of marketing tricks. Marketing what? Yeah. I went to preach when pastor say, let's declare counseling tomorrow. Let's declare counseling. I say, what for now? I don't do counseling in my church. Because there's no need for it. Even when I ask people, they don't come in our church for counseling. Why do you want me to do counseling? He said, it is during counseling that we will, we will tell them how much to give. Said, that is when we will make the money. I said, which money? <laughs> he said, that is when we will make the money. When they come, we, we give them something like revelation. Then we do them like that and tell them, yeah, go and bring. So we will collect all the money we need during counseling. That's when to make the money. I said, you have met the wrong man. <laughs> you have met the wrong man. That's not why I'm here. And for information, I'm not doing any counseling. I'm going to preach one more tomorrow night and I'm out of this place for good. Bless you. It was very sad. Very, very sad. I went to preach in a church in London. The executive secretary of the church was telling me after we met, after a while, she said, my pastor was totally disappointed. I said, why? He said, you came and just preached preached and got everybody blessed. The whole church was on fire. Unlike our services of before. And as you close, everybody left. Even when prophets stood, I was waiting for them to come as usual. So you can give them individual vision. Nobody came. <laughs> he said the members looked at him, looked at themselves and went. He stood there and nobody came. He said he turned to me and said to me, this man has spoiled market. 
this man has spoiled market. He called an ESCO meeting that night. I didn't know all this. He said, he called the ESCO and said, this man will not preach here tomorrow. He has spoiled market. He said, all the ESCO say, we love his message. The man turned around, looked at the girl and said, this man has spoiled business. He has spoiled market. He said, this before now, will have gotten some money. Pounds will have entered by hands. Nobody brought anything. He has spoiled market. He won't come here again. I came the next day. The people saw me and started screaming. Liberty. I preached the message of Christ. And as I left, the man told me, we'll bring you back. Till today, he has not called me. As far as he's concerned, the church is a, a business center. The members are the goods. People, people can be wicked. You take the precious souls of people that Jesus died for and you're making them into goods and services. Making them into goods and services. See, there are people that make merchandise. Anyone who preaches the gospel for money withdraw from him. Withdraw from him. Our motive is not money. Our motive is people's lives. Money will come, but that's not the target. We preach not ourselves, but Jesus and him crucified. Praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. Second Thessalonians 3, 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. People in church who are rebellious, disobedient with all the teaching they are hearing they are living contrary to the teaching they do not obey our doctrine our by this epistle mark them and withdraw from them you cannot know that a brother is living in rebellion you know it and you're still romancing him you're still playing around with him he said mark them and withdraw from them so you can save your neck and preserve your future companion Communication. Company. Very important. Are we together? I say, are we together? You must know them. In Romans 6, 17, he say, mark them and avoid them. Don't keep company with him. That he may be ashamed. Amen? That he may be what? There's another group of people. First Timothy 5, 8. They don't take care of their household. They don't take care of their household. The children of the brother comes to church. You look at them. All their buttocks have eyes. All their buttocks have eyes. And he is well dressed. Like a United Nations speaker. But all his children are running around. Their buttocks. Their bum bum has eyes. You know eyes? Yes. All over. <laughs> and because of that he makes sure they don't go home with him. They are always with their mother. Always with their mother. Nobody knows he's their father. Because he himself is ashamed of them. <laughs> eh? Yes, yet he does nothing about it. I'm from such to stay away. Because if you stay with him, he will still start telling you why your children should wear those kind of clothes. <laughs> and before you know it, influence. Influence is powerful. Ah, leave that thing. He said, any provide not for his own and especially for those of his own house he had denied the faith and is worse than an infidel anybody beat his wife anyhow maltreat her treat her like trash uh -uh. you have not so learned christ you have not so learned christ are we together here you have not so learned christ husband love your wives even as christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Whatever you learn, this identity in Christ must reflect in your conduct. First Corinthians 7 39. The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will only in the Lord. Only. Don't go and carry one chain smoker and bring who doesn't know Jesus and say we're married. He's talking about widows here. That even widows, if they decide to marry, even their marriage must be in the Lord. And of course, when people are born again and born of God genuinely, they are 
interested in serving others. They want to serve others. Service is a very powerful key in reflecting the true nature. We want to serve people. We want to be a blessing in the body of Christ. Hallelujah. What do I do if I, if, if I know a brother who is in sin? Bible says, restore him. In the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But I'm talking about a brother who does not want to be accountable, does not want to take correction, does not want to make adjustments. That kind of person. What do you do? Avoid him. Stay away from him. Stay away from him. Hallelujah. And somebody says, so if I'm already in one of these traps, what do I do? Well, first of all, change your company. Change your company. Number two, develop an appetite for the word and begin to chew the word. That's all. Change your company. Number two, begin to eat the word. Begin to eat the word. Start to feed on the word. Eat the word as if there's no tomorrow. Feed yourself. When you are full, nobody will tell you. Most believers are misbehaving because they are malnourished. And why are they malnourished? They've been influenced negatively. When you are fed, you have strength to make the right decisions. It won't fail. It's the beginning of a new day. Praise the Lord. You can be born again and yet you are dead in your conduct. You can be born again and yet you are a sinner in your conduct. Is that true? You can be born again and yet you are of no faith in your conduct. So, whoever you are must reflect in your lifestyle. When that begins to happen, you are beginning to live out your spirituality. Praise the Lord. Spirituality is not talking and acting pious. Spirituality is allowing the true nature of God in you to reflect in your conduct. I decree today, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you will not fail. Please rise to your feet. Say with me, I'm born of God. The nature of God is reflecting in my speech, in my conduct, in my attitude, in my dressing, in my relationships. The nature of God is rising big on my inside and overshadowing everything that is contrary to what Christ has done. So I declare, I am born of God. I walk in the spirit. I live in the spirit. I walk in the spirit. I live in the spirit. I'm born of the spirit. I reign in life. I didn't hear your amen. amen. And I decree by the power of the Holy Spirit that beginning from this service, every area of struggle ceases in your life. Amen. Every area of struggle ceases in your life. Amen. Barriers are broken. Anyone here that has been trapped by a wrong relationship, that relationship is scattered. It's scattered. Receive the grace to walk out of those relationships and stay in an environment where Christ will be fully formed in you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Every need is met. This week will be a week of sunshine. A week of great grace. A week of favors. A week of grace. A week of blessings. In the name of Jesus. It is well with you. What Christ has done in you is perfect. The enemy can do nothing about it. Every day you are conformed into his image and decree that the true nature of Christ will take effect and manifest through your attitude, through your conduct, and through your lifestyle. It is well with you. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Can I hear that amen like thunder? Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome back. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. I'm so excited about the word. Oh, Jesus. The word of God comes every day to equip and build us up. Now, don't go away. This important information is very important. We are beginning Power City campuses all over the world. A campus is a branch or an extension of Power City in your locality. That's the meaning of the word campus. And the scripture tells us a campus or a branch begins with where two or three are gathered together in his name. Now, these campuses are for people who don't have a local church where you attend, but you've been following my teachings and you want to be a part of what we're doing. Or... You used to attend a local church, but as you began to listen to my teachings, you discover that the messages in that church are not centered on Christ. And so you don't feel any more belonging. You don't feel at home in that local assembly. And you're praying for a, a fellowship of believers where Jesus is the center, a Christocentric fellowship, a Christ-centered fellowship. Well, the Power City Campus comes to your locality. The names, the, the cities, and the areas where we're going to be launching soon are coming on the screen right now. And included in the list is Abuja. We're launching in Abuja. 
We're launching in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, take note. We're launching in Mombasa, Kenya. We already have one in Nairobi that will be starting. We're also launching in Ohio, Cincinnati. We're also launching in Canada, Cape Town, South Africa, Kampala, Uganda. So those of you who live in the areas where I've just mentioned, where campuses are beginning, if you want to be a part, shoot a mail today, and we will hook you up with our coordinator in that part of the world. But I'm excited. What a day to be alive. In our campuses, Jesus will be glorified. The message of Christ will be taught. The Lordship of Jesus will be heralded. Believers will be equipped and built up. We will go out and evangelize, bring in new converts and disciple them and, call and help them to grow in the knowledge of Christ. It's going to be exciting. The days ahead are exciting. This The army, the end time army is rising. The Jesus revolution people are rising all over the world. And you are part of that. You are part of that army. And I'm excited that we're able to make this happen in our generation. I love you and I'm excited. Tell everybody about what's going on here. And don't forget to hook up in the remaining times of the broadcast. You know, we're on every morning, 6 a.m., 12 noon in the afternoon, GMT plus one, and 10 p.m. at night. It's, it's ongoing. And there's a lot of teachings going on to equip you, to edify you, to build you up. So in turn, you can do the work of the ministry. Remember, I'll be bringing a very, very strong teaching on doctrine where it concerns the church, finances, giving in the local church, offerings, tithes, and the whole nine yards as it relates to money. You don't want to miss the broadcast tomorrow, 10 p.m. GMT plus one, only at night. It will be on. You want to get everybody who has had issues with monies and givings in the church to hook up to the teaching tomorrow. I'm excited about the goodness of God. I look forward to bringing more word to you, and I look forward to reading your mails for those who want to be part of our campuses. And until then, you know I love you. Enjoy the rest of your day, the grace of Jesus.